from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, so we're going to get started. Thanks for coming out over uh, noontime uh, in this glorious, glorious day. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. And I want to welcome you uh, to our final Literary Birthdays event of the year uh, to celebrate Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, Ms. Brooks served as consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress from 1985 to 1986 and she is still remembered for her great work here in the DC community. This is especially relevant today because of our announcement of the new Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, Natasha Trethaway, who will take up residence here next spring. It's the first time since we've announced a Poet Laureate, or since we've had a Poet Laureate, that we'll have a, a Laureate here in residency. So it's very, very exciting news, and I'm, I'm sure um, Gwendolyn Brooks would be, would be happy to hear uh, that we're returning to that. Let me just take a minute to ask you to turn off your cell phones and any electronic devices you have, uh, which uh, might interfere with the event. And let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are the home of the Poet Laureate and put on li literary readings, lectures, and panels of all sorts throughout the year with partners such as the Rare Books and Special Collections Division. If you'd like to find out more about events like this uh, and, and hear about our uh, fall and spring 2013 uh, literary birthdays, uh, you can sign up our sign-up sheet. Uh, you can also check out our website at www.loc.poetry, and you can check out uh, the website of our co-sponsor, the Library's Rare Books and Special Collections Division, at www.loc.gov slash rr slash rare book slash. Uh, you all have programs on your seats. You can read more about uh, our feature poet and our two readers here today. Um, we're very excited to have Kyle Dargan here from the D.C. area and to have Janice Harrington uh, come from Illinois, two places that are key to uh, Brooks's history. Both Kyle and Janice will read from their favorite Brooks poems and discuss the importance of her to their own work as well as read a few poems of their own. Following our readings, Amanda, Zim Amanda Zimmerman from the library's Rare Books and Special Collections Division will come up to talk about our wonderful tabletop display we have here uh, of, of Brooks materials. She will also talk about the work that uh, the Rare Books and Special Collections does to help uh, preserve such uh, treasures for future generations of poets and poetry lovers. Um, so it's a great treat. Uh, so uh, please help me in welcoming Kyle Dargan and Janice Harrington. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know noon is a, can be a tough time for many things, including poetry. Um, so I'm very happy to see the room full. I um, just want to start with some brief, somewhat prepared comments um, and read a few of Brooks' poems and as uh, Rob suggested, a few of my own. Um, when Gwendolyn Brooks transitioned in the year 2000, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Virginia enrolled in Rita Dove's Advanced Poetry Workshop. As a 19-year-old neophyte writer, my prior experience and exposure to poetry came from reading that I did outside of my high school classes. And while I owned a copy of Dudley Randall's The Black Poets, the selections in that anthology can only be considered a cursory introduction to the breadth of Brooks' work. And I do not remember reading then as a young man with no guidance my encounter with that text provided me with much sense of Brooks' significance. When she transitioned, I did notice that Rita Dove, my teacher, who I admired greatly and whose office hours I unwittingly uh, monopolized, <laughs> was less available on campus. This was due to the fact that she, like many other notable poets around the country, had taken up the task of standing in at various events that Brooks had committed to before passing. The writing aside, I found myself greatly impressed that Brooks was still giving so many public readings into her later years, and that such notable poets, fellow laureates such as Rita Dove, were willing to reorganize their schedules to accommodate covering her remaining commitments. It became clear to me then 
that not only had we lost an accomplished writer, a sharp, ambitious, and compassionate voice, but also a true ambassador for poetry, someone kind enough to live publicly as a poet. Um, and I actually wanted to read a brief excerpt from an interview that uh, one of the Brooks did with Ethelbert Miller at the Library of Congress. I believe this is uh, 1986, and she's talking about her work at the library. She says, yes, I do enjoy working with children, talking with them. They're amazing. I had about 30 children in this very poetry room about a week ago, and what a time we had. They talked about not just poetry, but about their grandmothers, about beer, about pizza, and about hair. When I came here, I thought that that was what I was supposed to do, to share my feelings about poetry with anyone who was interested. And being in Washington, D.C. and learning through oral histories how Brooks' work as poetry consultant at the Library of Congress embodied that ethos um, is very much shaped the way I think about my own public persona and duty as a poet. Um, and I think a great way to celebrate her birthday uh, is the announcement you know, of another African-American female uh, poet laureate. And I can't wait to talk to Natasha and convince her to get some kids in here and so we can have some more laughter um, and discussions that include possibly beer and pizza. <laughs> um, in terms of the writing um, and my personal connection to Gwendolyn Brooks, I was born in North New Jersey. Um, when I came to DC, I lived uh, in Glover Park for a while, but now I live in Southeast DC. Um, so pretty much most of my life, except for my college years, is spent in uh, primarily African-American urban environments, working class environments. Um, and I think, if anything, uh, when, I, when I think about Gwendolyn Brooks is, um, one, the many levels of interiority she brings uh, to the African-American working class community. You think about going inside the house, you think about going inside the community, uh, you even think about going inside the mind, um, and that we get so many layers um, and why that's important is it's something I didn't feel as much as when I lived in Newark, but um, definitely living here, um, there's a lot of judgment uh, in terms of you know who the people are um, that live on the other side of the river and what they do. Um, and when you read Brooks's work about those communities in Chicago, uh, you see how much they're, they're very much absent of judgment or a need to explain. You know, most of her work it comes from a genuine interest in trying to understand. Um, if I can get this to work, I'll actually play a little bit of her uh, reading. Um, we real cool. I'm not going to read that. I wouldn't dare read that if I could actually access the audio. So hopefully that'll work. You know, but one of the things she says is that you know she generally wanted to not judge those children as she saw um, playing pool, but understand like what is it that put them in that situation. Um, so that's that's definitely one thing, and also her compassion. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks me a very, a very compassionate poet, um, and that's one of the things I try to strive for in my own work. And I'm actually writing some poems about Southeast DC. Um, I'll say maybe fashioned after what some of uh, Brooks was doing in uh, Street and Bron Bronzeville and Annie Allen. I don't want to say it's like my version of that because I wouldn't dare. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of working in that tradition a bit with that in mind. So I'll read some of those poems, I'll read a few of my own, um, and that'll be the end of me. So, but I want to start you know, with that idea of the interior and going inside um, with a poem probably most people are familiar with, um, Kitchenette Building. We are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes, its white and violet, fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall, flutter or sing an aria down these rooms, 
even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warm it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin. We wonder, but not well, not for a minute. Since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water, hope to get in. Again, um, just the compassion with which she treats the people um, and the dignity of their lives that she tries to express. Um, the first Gwendolyn Brooks poem that really knocked me out was The Mother. Because um, I, I, I tend to be very impressed by when I, when I meet a poet and they do something that I would either be afraid to do or I never thought to do before. Um, so when I encountered that poem, um, at first I was somewhat shocked. Um, but then once I got past that, I was you know, again amazed at what Brooks was able to do. Uh, speaking of the piece, um, in a 1961 interview, and this is interesting because I, I, you know, to give it some context, she says, uh, once again, I was trying to understand how people must feel, in this case, a mother who never really became a mother. This poem was the only poem in the book that Richard Wright, who first looked at it, wanted to omit. And he felt that a proper poem could not even be written about abortions. But I felt otherwise, and I was glad that the publishers left it in. So, the mother. Abortions will not let you forget. You remember the children you got that you did not get the damp, small pulps with a little or with no hair, the singers and workers that never handled the air. You will never neglect or beat them or silence or buy with the sweet. <clears throat> you will never wind up, <clears throat> you'll never wind up the suckling thumb or scuttle off ghosts that come. You will never leave them controlling your luscious sigh. Return for a snack of them with gobbling mother eye. I have heard in the voices of the wind the voices of my dim killed children. I have contracted, I have eased my dim dears at the breast they could never suck. I have said, sweets, if I sin, if I seize your luck, and your lies from your unfinished reach. If I stole your births and your names, your straight baby tears and your games, your stilted or lovely loves, your tumults, your marriages, aches, and your deaths. If I poison the beginnings of your breath, believe that even in my deliberateness, I was not deliberate. Though, why should I whine? Wine that the crime was other than mine, since anyhow you are dead, or rather, or instead, you were never made. But that too, I am afraid, is faulty. Oh, what shall I say? How is the truth to be said? You were born, you had body, you died. It is just that you never giggled or planned or cried. Believe me, I loved you all. Believe me, I knew you, though faintly. And I loved, I loved you all. And this is a poem that I actually, maybe foolishly, um, attempted to respond to um, from a male perspective. Uh, this piece, um, somewhat predictably, is called The Father. In 
And um, the poem takes a few lines from another Gwendolyn Brooks poem, uh, To Be In Love. The Father, after Brooks. To be in love is to touch things with a lighter hand. Know this of me, I loved her all. Loved the anomaly of you who did not have form, bright gnarl of tissue on the inner hull. Yes, you could have traveled with us. You do carry with us. This ball we bounced and stilled, the floating throb of unresolved energy because, because I'm musing as though you can hear me, denied spirit, off to another body gate. You are the beautiful half of a golden hurt. So let her hate me today for never having to know the remnant blood in carnal seams. Your silence never lets me forget her. I believe that mine was love for her, with you, and her, without. Okay. Um, I think Brooks also had a way of being dark and funny. Uh, I think another poem from Street in Bronzeville, a song in the front yard, uh, captures that. Um, and I'll try to read one of my, my Southeast poems that maybe speaks on the other side of this experience. So, uh, a song in the front yard. I've stayed in the front yard all my life. I want to peek at the back, where it's rough and untended and hungry weed grows. A girl gets sick of a rose. I want to go in the backyard now and maybe down the alley to where the charity children play. I want a good time today. They do some wonderful things. They have some wonderful fun. My mother sneers, but I say it's fine how they don't have to go in at a quarter to nine. My mother, she tells me that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman. That George will be taken to jail soon or late on account of last winter he stole our back gate. But I say it's fine, honest, I do. And I'd like to be a bad woman too. And wear the brave stockings of night black lace and struck down the streets with paint on my face. Um, so one night I was um, looking out my window and I saw a young girl walking down the street with uh, someone who I imagine or believed uh, was her parent uh, in pursuit. And it's about 11.35 at night. Um, and, you know, one of those situations will make you think if you haven't had kids, it might be possibly something you want to do um, if you're going to wind up chasing children down the street at 11.35 at night. <laughs> um, but then, I, you know, I, I was thinking about the Brooks poem, and you think about, you know, that, that desire to go out and be bad, and that at some point, as the parent, like, you're going to lose. Like, at, at some point, she is going to go to the backyard. At some point, she is going to be the bad woman. Um, and what do you do in that situation? Um, so this poem is called 16. Um, and the 16 in the poem um, was this, this girl who was walking. 16. 16 turns her back to you and walks into the night. Her backpack a fading pink beacon in the shadowless streets 
or these streets where all is shadow. 1135 and darkening. Hush, say the bright house windows of those still awake. Your shouting after her only accents the tranquil beeline that she is marching, not vice versa. Her flight gives you no new sense of purpose. You are a parent. You are wrapped with the parental motions of giving chase. But the evening has already been abandoned by its stars. And tonight, there is little hope that 16's sneakered heels will pivot and return to you. Ah, so now we get to see if this is gonna work. say June in Chicago must be very different than June in DC, right? <laughs> One more poem, but um, I wanted to play that, and I, I do think there's something to that idea of June as a peaceful month because um, in Southeast DC it's quite opposite. June is when people start uh, getting shot, um, but and it, it's interesting she talks about the different ways that people take the jazzing of June. I had never thought of it as sexual, but you know coming out of the urban environments I came out of, you know, I, I took the jazzing of June as like the moment of, you know, improvisation where you let kids out for the summer and they start making it up for themselves and uh, things start happening. Um, so I guess I wanted to write a, a poem from, from that perspective in terms of engaging with June on a different level. Um, and this actually, this piece takes a, uh, it's titled from the last line of uh, We Real Cool, but it's also invoking the preceding line. Um, so we die soon. This jazz, once you learn it as your own, you will listen to the brassy chatter of old brown men riffing on recent murder. 
the boy who was killing folks, the one who had the claw hammer. No, in Virginia, the boy slashing women's behinds. No, sir, this boy was stabbing people, cold. Seated on concave milk crates, or their sweat and motor oil anointed limbs drooping off a pickup truck's gate, all slack except for their fingers clutching a cold beer. Through appreciation, you will learn to distinguish when the hollers of youngins will end with sweet jabs and dap, from when the hollers will summon sirens, red and blue lights up the hill. Electricity drowns the nights. The restless birds sing back to the evening gunshots, the magnum's baritone pow. With age, you'll come to fear June's music its melodies of bleeding boys, another uneven tempo of assault and armed thefts omitted from the newspaper. They want to get white folk moving over here. This is not transcribed music. These notes puncture, lodge, and vertebrae, make jukeboxes of our spines. To know this jazz well is to be rigid with song and then to be eventually bent by it. Uh, where am I on time? All right, this, this is about Wendell Brooks, not about me. So let me cut my poems and read. One last piece. Again, um, I think Brooks, so much of her work is about the dignity um, of the people in these communities. Um, and I often, I often wonder myself whether or not, you know, what, what we call the hood, what I call the hood, um, and that's not necessarily um, derogatory. There are lots of people who think of home um, as the hood. But, I, you know, think about the hood as whether or not it's a place that actually chokes out um, different aesthetics. Um, and I think directly and indirectly, uh, this poem from the womanhood section of Annie Allen, uh, <clears throat> Brooks is engaged in that discourse of thinking about when you're in these harsh environments, how do you find or make time uh, to create art? Um, so this is the fourth verse um, from Children of the Poor. First fight, then fiddle. Ply the slipping string with feathery sorcery. Muzzle the note with hurting love. The music that they wrote, bewitch, bewilder. <clears throat> Qualify to sing threadwise. Devise no salt, no hempen thing for the dear instrument to bear. Devote the bow to silks and honey. Be remote. And while from malice, uh, be remote a while from malice and from murdering. But first to arms, to armor. Carry hate in front of you and harmony behind. Be deaf to music and to beauty blind. Win war, rise bloody. Maybe not too late for having first to civilize a space wherein to play your violin with grace. Um, and I'll stop there and turn it over to Janice. So. Happy birthday, Gwendolyn Brooks. And thank you for this marvelous legacy of poetry. Thank you also to the Library of Congress uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here, to Rob Casper, and thank you all of you for supporting uh, the literary birthday celebrations. For over 22 years, I've been a children's librarian at the Champaign Public Library in Champaign, Illinois. And that means that for over 22 years, I've helped grade school children who've come in 
during the National Month of Poetry, during Black History Month, to do their reports on a famous African American, on a famous African American poet, and of course on our beloved uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the poet laureate of Illinois uh, from 1968. They would come in to do a report about her. I went into middle school classrooms with We Real Cool and turned it into a call and response participation poem. I took the poems from Bronzeville uh, Boys and Girls and did them as finger plays with preschool children. And we were especially fortunate because in the mid-90s, Gwendolyn Brooks came to visit our library. Everybody came to see her. We were totally enchanted and funny, witty, that woman made razor blades seem dull. <laughs> okay. um, and what everybody talked about afterwards was that when you stood before her, it was as if the entire world disappeared. She gave you her full attention. And Gwendolyn Brooks gave her attention to the world around her, to the, sh the black community of Chicago, to its youth, to her neighbors, and especially to her family. I want to start with this poem in honor of David Anderson Brooks, my father, July 30th, 1883 to November 21st, 1959. A dryness is upon the house my father loved and tended. Beyond his firm and sculptured door, his light and lease have ended. He walks the valleys now, replies to wind and sun forever. No more the cramping chambers chill, no more the hindering fever. Now out upon the wide, clean air, my father's soul revives, all innocent of self-interest and the fear that strikes and strives. He who was goodness, gentleness, and dignity is free, translates to public love, old, private, charity. The deep feelings that she felt for her father, she also felt for the struggle of women, for the struggles of the black community, and of the poor. And for this next poem, I'm going to need you to use your imagination. Okay. You're going to be in a car driving through a wealthy neighborhood. I don't know if you've ever done that. <laughs> seeing people who seem to have a little bit more than you do. Okay. So you're going to be in that car, and maybe you're going to compare yourself. Maybe you'll hear their cell phones going off. <laughs> and you'll say, but they have one of those fancy phones. That's what you'll say. But you're in that car, and this is Beverly Hills, Chicago. The dry brown coughing beneath their feet. Only a while, for the handyman is on his way. These people walk their golden gardens. We say ourselves fortunate to be driving by today. That we may look at them in their gardens where the summer ripeness rots. But not raggedly. Even the leaves fall down in lovelier patterns here. And the refuse, the refuse is a neat brilliancy. When they flow sweetly into their houses with softness and slowness touched by that everlasting gold, we know what they go to, to tea. But that does, does not mean that they will throw some little black dots in some water and add sugar and the juice of the cheapest lemons that are sold. While downstairs that woman's vague phonograph bleats, knock me a kiss, and the living all to be made again in the sweatingest physical manner. Tomorrow, not that anybody is saying that these people have no trouble, 
merely that it is trouble with a gold-flecked, beautiful banner. Nobody is saying that these people do not ultimately cease to be. And sometimes their passings are even more painful than our own. It's just that so often they live till their hair is white. They make excellent corpses <laughs> among the expensive flowers. Nobody is furious. Nobody hates these people. At least nobody driving by in this car. It is only natural, however, that it should occur to us how much more fortunate they are than we are. It is only natural that we should look and look at their wood and brick and stone and think while a breath of pine blows how different these are from our own. We do not want them to have less, but it is only natural that we should think we have not enough. We drive on. We drive on when we speak to each other. Our voices are a little gruff. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks said, we are each other's business. We are each other's bond. We are here to be a witness for justice and compassion. Today, be willing to stand up for truth by your presence, your words, and actions. People who recall Gwendolyn Brooks always talk about her generosity, her generosity to poets and especially to the young. As Kyle pointed out, if she had a passion, it was for young people to the core. She cared about them. And rereading her poems, I find so many that speak to us about problems that we're facing today, the same problems, <coughs> that her words are still contemporary, and that, as always, she's standing up for youth, and that her words are an instrument of hope. To the young who want to die. to the young who want to die. Sit down, inhale, exhale. The gun will wait, the lake will wait. The tall gall in the small seductive vial will wait, will wait. We'll wait a week, we'll wait through April. You do not have to die this certain day. Death will abide, will pamper your postponement. I assure you, death will wait. Death has a lot of time. Death can attend to you tomorrow or next week. Death is just down the street, is most obliging neighbor, can meet you any moment. You need not die today. Stay here through pout or pain or peskiness. Stay here. See what the news is going to be tomorrow. Graves grow green. Graves grow no green that you can use. Remember, green's your color. You are spring. Gwendolyn Brooks um, told stories. She took snapshots of people with words. I tried to do the same thing with my poetry, and I'm going to read you two poems from my newest book, The Hands of Strangers, Poems from the Nursing Home. I worked part-time and full-time as a nurse's aide in a county nursing home, and as well as a private nursing home. And these are the stories um, that I put together in this book and I hope that you will like them. Pinch, pinch. In a room bright with sunlight, an aide 
feeds Perret to an old woman in a wheelchair. The old woman, blinded by cataracts, rolls the brownish mash between her lips. The aide scrapes the woman's lips and chin with the spoon edge and pushes the spillings between her lips again. But the old woman does not want to eat or perhaps needs more time to swallow or perhaps does not like the brown mash and instead she spits. The aide spoons more mash between her lips and the old woman, reaching, snatches the skin on the aide's bare arm and squeezes it. Squeezes its fold hard between two rooty fingers, smiling. She thinks by this small violence that she has won. That she is the victor of the contest, not to be ignored, not defenseless. But this aide pinches her back. Fierce and sharp, the old woman widens opaque eyes, straining to see this scorpion, this scissor-beaked bird, this all in mirror image, this enemy. But in her eyes are cloud banks, splinters of dazzle and shadow. She sees nothing and feels pinpricks, ice, broken glass, and hate, hate, hate. <coughs> they spar. Pinch for pinch. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> I'm just doing this because I want your sympathy. <laughs> <coughs> it's, it's always entertaining <coughs> to watch a poet choke to death on stage. <coughs> <coughs> I should say, too, that the aid in this poem is not me. So <coughs> it is not guilt that you're seeing. OK, let me back up a little bit. But in her eyes are cloud banks, splinters of dazzle and shadow. She sees nothing and feels pinpricks, ice, broken glass, and hate, hate, hate. They spar pinch for pinch until the eyes draw their curtains, until at last there comes a cry that no one hears but the aide, who takes the tray and taps the spoon against the glass, clears the parade splat splatter. Whatever is uneaten remains so. Whatever hungers goes unfed. Okay, the next poem I have to recoup. I think I've got my voice back. And there's a poem I'm going to need your help with. And I'm going to make the Library of Congress very unhappy because clearly you can never have too many powerful enemies by, <laughs> by not using the mic. When I point to you like this, unless I'm choking, <laughs> you're supposed to say Ingalls. Ingles. You're supposed to say it like you're alive. Ingles. You're supposed to say it like you made it. Ingles. Ingles. All right. um, when I was working on this book, you know, I'm calling my memories. I'm talking to my mother because my mother was a nurse today and my sister was a nurse today. And I, I'm trying to think of poems. I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. I thought to myself, I wonder if in, in any of my old diaries I've written something that I could use for a poem. And I went through these old diaries and I found one thing. This poem is called May Ingalls, and I'm going to make sure that I get through it without having a coughing fit. <laughs> it has an epigraph. May Ingalls died yesterday. No family, no friends, no possessions. <coughs> Just a room provided by the county. No pastor, no nurses, no anything. No book will ever give her a sentence. Age Diary, August 11, 1977. May Ingalls died, and she died of scurvy. May Ingalls died, and she died of sorrow. May Ingalls died, and she died like this. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> May Ingalls died, 
Or maybe she did. Tomorrow, ring bells, burn effigies of crones, declare it May Ingalls Day. Let mothers name their babies May or Ingalls. Let astrologers rename Orion's belt and call it May Ingalls Garter. Let the believer see her face on mildew wallpaper in a day's end in Biloxi. Let biologists name a newly discovered orchid May Ingalls or a moth or a deep sea squid not seen since the Pliocene era. Let poets write in the form of May Ingalls, small and plain and common. May you travel with 30 other pilgrims to find her grave, but not finding it, may you open a boutique to sell May Ingalls memorabilia <laughs> and sack lunches to tourists who want to lie in the county bed where May Ingalls died. <laughs> may you live out your days as happy as May Ingalls. May you whisper before pressing your tongue against the slope of your beloved's neck. May Ingalls pluck the feathers of the last Lord Godbird. Yesterday, anthropologists discovered the image of a small woman leaping amidst a herd of antelope at Lascaux. They have called her May Ingalls. <laughs> May Ingalls has seven overdue library books. Before your right kidney, the doctor will find proof of May Ingalls. Yes. Ingalls. You are in good health. <laughs> <laughs> On a playground in Alabama, Black girls clap their hands. They've made a rhyme for May Ingalls. Oh, May Ingalls. Ingalls. Looks like shingles. Ingalls. Her bones go jingle. Ingalls. Her toenails tingle. Ingalls. Your daddy stole a pudding. Ingalls. You make him on the cry. Ingalls. Now they're gonna hang him on the 4th of July. <laughs> the water laughs. May and May is The earth answers and the wind and the boy swinging his toes above the dock, all with the same glad syllable, May and May and May. Afterward, the boy will snatch a fish from the dark water. He'll split its belly and find a golden ring. Lifting the ring, he'll cry, May Some say a small woman now stands beside them. She touches those whom death chooses. She lifts the dead from their tangled veins as if their bodies were beds they lay in for too long. Some say that before dying, if you whisper the woman's name, death will slow. Surprised that you remember a woman without family or monument or possession. Death will slow and you will have a moment and maybe another moment I'm going to close with two poems by um, Gwendolyn Brooks. You can't be from Alabama, I was born in Vernon, Alabama, and live in the state of Illinois without reading of DeWitt Williams on his way to Lincoln Cemetery. He was born in Alabama. He was bred in Illinois. He was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet cherry. <coughs> nothing but a plain black boy. Drive him past the pool hall drive him past the show, blind within his casket, but maybe he will know. Down through 47th Street, underneath the L and Northwest Corner Prairie that he loves so well. Don't forget the dance halls, Warwick and Savoy, where he picked his women, where he drank his liquid joy. Born in Alabama, bred in Illinois, he was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet chariot. Nothing but a plain black boy. It was an honor to read to you today, 
and it seems so appropriate then to share you, with you a poem that Gwendolyn Brooks used to thank her audiences and to recognize them. It's called Infirm. Everybody here, well, let, let, let me make sure to set you up for this. Any of you have aches and pains? <laughs> you want to raise it. The people here are going to sympathize. <laughs> All right. Infirm. Everybody here is infirm. Everybody here is infirm. Oh, mend me, mend me, Lord. Today I say to them, say to them, say to them, Lord, look. I am beautiful, beautiful with my wing that is wounded, my eye that is bonded, or my ear not funded, or my walk all a wobble. I'm enough to be beautiful. You are beautiful too. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I'm delighted to be here today honoring Gwendolyn Brooks, who was a remarkable woman, poet, novelist, essayist. Um, the Rare Book and Special Collections Division has strong holdings in American literature and is committed to building comprehensive collections of the works of all the Poet Laureate. And um, the books that I have on display for you today uh, span the various periods of Brooks' career and speak to her talent as well as her ability to be a voice for generation after generation of poets and African Americans. I have to start out by saying that the first book that Brooks published, A Street in Bronzeville, published by Harper Brothers in 1945, is not on the table because it is being prepared to go into our Books That Shaped America exhibit, which is starting at the end of this month. So I encourage everyone to come back on June 25th and check out that exhibit. It's going to be fantastic. Um, what I do have is, um, in 1949, Gwendolyn Brooks um, published Annie Allen, which she won the Pulitzer Prize for in 1950, making her the first African American in any genre to win that prize. And what I have here is a, it's a first edition, and it's a coming of age story of a girl's growth from childhood to the age of love and marriage and on to motherhood while she's experiencing racism and sexism in her community. Um, Brooks throughout the, the book has used um, varying poetic forms and she explores such themes as love, war, and womanhood. Uh, Langston Hughes, when he was reviewing the book, he wrote, and I quote, that the, the book provided sharp pictures of neighborhoods, relatives, friends, illnesses, and deaths of big city slums, cafes, and beauty shops. Um, in 1953, Harper and Brothers published her only prose novel called Mar Maud Martha. Um, and what we have here is actually signed by Brooks on the title page, and after you can come up and take a look at everything. Uh, this novel depicts um, racism, sexism, and classism through the eyes of an African-American woman just before, during, and after World War II. Um, and what I really loved about this work is you can tell how, how particular she is in her word choice, even in her prose writing. And I found a quote of hers. Then uh, she wrote, even in writing prose, I find myself weighing the possibilities of every word just as I do in a poem. This was true when I used to write uh, reviews as well. And I thought that that said a lot about how careful she was and how important every word really was to her in everything that she wrote. And that says a lot about her as a writer. Um, the next book I have um, brought out today is The Bean Eaters, published in 1960. This is a first edition, um, and it explores the racial and economic tensions that play out in the lives of everyday people in Chicago's South Side neighborhood. Um, at this time, she had started to experiment with free verse while still using the um, strict poetic styles uh, a little bit, so it was kind of a more mixed uh, poetry. And it shows us the lived consequences of political injustices. So um, another notable thing about this book is it includes We Real Cool, which is often considered her most popular work, um, whether she would like that or not. I mean, you heard her earlier. Um, and the, I have here the version that was published in 1966 by the Broadside Press, which I will talk about a little bit more later. 
Um, but what was interesting about this work is that these young boys are rebelling against the society that they're, they feel don't, doesn't respect them, doesn't want them. And so they're breaking out from this society and they're finding a place where they can belong. And Brooks often noted that gangs also provided this kind of negative space where um, social outcasts would feel more um, included. And in the late 60s, she began fostering the talents of young African-American writers. Um, she would sponsor poetry workshops and uh, contests and competitions where she would fund the awards with her own money. Um, and she also visited many schools, prisons, hospitals, and drug rehabilitation centers in the hopes of teaching children that poetry can also provide a positive space where you can feel included and feel um, respected and understood. Um, in 1967, um, Brooks experienced a political awakening when she attended Fisk University's second Black Writers Conference. Um, and after that point, her work really changed and became um, more assertive and positive. And so what I have from that period of her life, um, I have In the Mecca, which was published by Harper and Brothers in 1968. It's a first edition. The Mecca was a vast, fortress-like apartment building erected on the south side of Chicago in 1891, which quickly deteriorated into a slum. And the story follows a mother in search of her lost child, and throughout the story we're introduced to all these other characters and individuals who live in the building. And what's notable about each of these characters is that everyone in the building seems to have adjusted to life there by isolating themselves and not having any sense of community or responsibility to anyone else in the, in the building. And so what's interesting is that while the Mecca, this, this large building, encloses and compresses everyone, it doesn't actually bring the people any closer together. Um, and so this was published in the same year, in 1968, that she was named Poet Laureate of Illinois, which was a position she held until, until she passed um, in 2000. And um, in 1969, she left Harper and Brothers, whose work, who had published her work since 1945. Um, so this was a long-standing relationship that she broke to go to Broadside Press, which was a smaller um, African-American press from D Detroit run by Dudley Randall, who was a poet and a librarian. And um, he, uh, they published Riot together, which I have on the stand over there, um, which is also a first edition dedicated to Dudley Randall. And it's a series of three poems following the 1968 Chicago riots, which resulted um, directly from the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so they're really, um, they're very powerful poems. Um, next I have her, the first part of her autobiography, Report from Part One. And that was published in 1972. And I found a really great quote from a reviewer of the book, and I, I, I think that this is the best way to describe it. It's a combination of memoirs and interviews, and um, it's, this quote really says it all. Um, I quote, the book is not a sustained dramatic narrative for the nosy, being neither the confessions of a private woman poet or the usual sort of mahogany desk memoir public personages inflict upon the populace at the first sign of a cardiac. It documents the growth of Gwen Brooks. And I, I really thought that described the book perfectly. Um, in 1980, Gwendolyn Brooks started her own press. And in 1985, she became the Poet Laureate of the Library of Congress. And in 1991, she published a book called Children Coming Home. Uh, what I have on the table is a first edition signed by Brooks. And um, it's a collection of 20 poems in children's voices. And they, each poem offers hope for children's potential to employ poetic language in order to understand and make sense of the world around them. Um, the, book, the book was published by the David Company, which was Brooks's own publishing com company named after her father. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, what I liked about it was that it's the cover of it, it's in the shape of this composition book, which brings kind of, at least I think, me back to school days and, and what it's like to be a child trying to figure out the world around you. Um, and so I thought that was really, it was, it's a really beautiful book. Um, over her career, she was awarded a number of really amazing awards, and she was um, received approximately 50 honorary doctorates from 
different colleges and universities, which I was shocked about. Um, and I invite everyone to come up and take a look at all the works that we have for you today. Many are signed, um, and just take it all in. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.